and welcome to you all. Welcome to New Church. Welcome to those who are watching via the internet, be it on Facebook or Zoom. As always, we ask that you take some time to like the channel so we can below subscription numbers up. I want to extend a special welcome to some visitors we have today. Today is a kind of a special, special day. Um, in my life, but also in the life of some very special people here. So I want to welcome all our visitors, especially those who are visiting for the first time. Joanna and her, her entourage, her friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, I, I was thinking the other day that when I was in high school and even in college, I wanted to ever get married. <laughs> and I got married. And I wondered if I could go for my father. <laughs> and then I think my father, my father, guy was an instant father, that was a natural father. And then I wondered after coming a father, if I could go for my grandfather. And I did. So you know what I'm wondering now? <laughs> if I was going to become a great. <laughs> but today we have uh, two of my grandchildren here with me, four of them actually. Um, and it's a very special power and a place them. So if I'm looking at it a bit um, chirper than usual, that's because of the fact that they're here, I'm going to bless them later on. So I know you're not here to hear me. You're here for the blessing of the child or the children, but um, so I'm going to keep tracking that short and as sweet as possible. So when you come once again, you trust your time with us this Wednesday. We know you could have been elsewhere. Um, you're in peace and you could have been probably working on some engine. No, you know, you could be there um, and watching some program or doing some shopping. But wherever, whatever the case is, we're glad that you're here. It's a time to, to be with us. And yes, I am Joanna's dad. <laughs> Today I want to talk a little bit about two trans. And before Lauren get all excited, I'm not talking about transvestites or transgender people. <laughs> Nor before Peter gets excited, I'm not talking about manual transmission or automatic transmission. I'm talking about transfiguration and transformation. Transfiguration and transformation. The title of this sermon, for those of you who like titles, is uh, His Transformation, His Transfiguration, sorry, Our Transformation. It takes a thing from Luke chapter 9. But before we start, I want to say another prayer. To be us pray, may please us, of course, God's throne together. Our Father in heaven, Almighty God, we thank you again so much for just bringing us together as you have, for allowing us to turn God to be here in your presence with friends, with family, with others of like mind. We have come to God to, to hear from you. But even as we do say to God, our minds are occupied with thoughts of troubles elsewhere. What's happening in Ukraine and surrounding areas? And Father, just ask that you just be with our brothers and our sisters over here. We ask to God that you resolve the conflict that is going on in the shortest possible time and bring peace back to that area. And even as we are gathered, Father, we just ask to help us not to take the peace that we have here for granted, but to realize that so much can change so quickly. And every to get the most of every opportunity that we have to come before you to hear from you. And today, Trump God, we assemble now to hear your word. We just want to ask that you will be blessed in speaking, very blessed in hearing as well. So that what needs to be heard will be heard, and what needs to be said will be said. So you just come into the service, into your hand, and ask your blessing. And what you're about to say and do, and we ask Trump God that you accept it. We will praise our thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Today is, uh, according to the Christian worship calendar, Transfiguration Sunday. Now, some of you probably never even heard about the word transfiguration, but I think you probably do. And we're going to look a little, a little bit about what it is. But it's Transfiguration Sunday. It's also the last day or the eighth Sunday after the Epiphany, which occurred on January 6th. It is also the first Sunday before Lent, which begins, as some of you may know, 
on Ash Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Now, all that may sound like a bit of a novelty or an unrelated list of facts. But I submit that they're all connected and they influence or affect us in ways that sometimes we don't realize. For example, you may have heard about Lent, many of you, and what people give up for Lent. You have obviously heard about Easter and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. You have heard about Christmas. But what the Christian worship calendar does is that it really helps us to focus on those events in Christ's life and to preach on those things so that we are forever minded about Him. And so the calendar, the Christian worship calendar of which I speak, does not begin on January 1 as the regular calendars do, nor does it begin in March, April as the budget calendar does. Rather, it begins uh, four weeks or four Sundays before Christmas Day with a season that is known as Advent. They may have heard about Advent because of the Adventists. Most of us think about the seven day Adventists are just seven day people because they worship on the seventh day. But they're also Adventists, meaning they look forward to the coming of Christ. And the season of Advent is a time when we look towards the coming of the Christ. And so there are four Sundays set aside, usually from the last Sunday in November or the first Sunday in December. And for four Sundays before Christmas, we observe the season of Advent and of course the, the interceding days. Advent then leads into Christmas. And most of you, I, so I believe, are familiar with Christmas. That's when we celebrate the birth of Christ. But did you know that Christmas is not really just a day. There is what they call a Christmas season that lasts for 12 days. So if you may have read the great play book by Shakespeare, The Twelfth Night, that twelfth night that Shakespeare spoke about in that book is the twelfth night of Christmas. You might have heard the song about on the first day of Christmas, the second, right? It's about the Christmas is a season and not just a day. Now that goes right up until from December 25 to January 6th, and you're going to get 12 days right there. January 6th is what, when the epiphany begins. That is when the Magi are supposed to have appeared, are, um, visited the Christ. Even though, as you read the Bible carefully, Bible carefully, you see that at that time, he was not a child. So you see all those images on cards, and so with the shepherds and the three wise men together, that probably didn't happen. Right? Because the shepherds would have seen him when he was about a day old. The wise men would have seen him for when he was one or two years old because they were following the stars. But whatever the situation is, that's what we celebrate at that time. But what that reason, what Epiphany is all about, and we are now on the eighth Sunday after Epiphany, it's a time when we look at the ministry of Christ. And the word Epiphany, as you might know, has to do with an awakening, it has to do with a revelation. And so what is supposed to happen in the time of Epiphany is we look at the life of Christ and we look at situations in his life that reveals to us certain things about him. And we transition from Epiphany, as we're going to do this Ash Wednesday, into the season of Lent, which lasts for 40 days. I guess some of you probably didn't know that. 40 days until Good Friday. Now, 40 in the Bible is a time of testing, just as the word seven, number 7. Is a time of perfection. Eight is a time of new beginning. Twelve is a time of government or that type of thing. Forty is a day of testing. And so a lot of people see Lent at a time of testing or repentance when they give up something. Now you may say, all oh, well and good, but how does that relate to me? Well, we have some young people here and some older people. And I think we're all familiar with Carnival, Bacchanal. Juve, Mardi Gras. Do you know what Mardi Gras means? Mardi is a French word for Tuesday. Gras, G-R-A-S, means great or fat. So Mardi Gras is fat Tuesday. If these were normal times, when there was no COVID concern, I don't know what's happening to that, 
but tomorrow will be Juve. Juve is a Caribbean word derived from the French Juve, right? Which means a dawning or a breaking forth. And what Juve is, is when all the mass camps and so on, the parade and road march and they come together as one. You know why? Think about it. Why Mardi Gras? Why Fat Tuesday? Why is it that Juve starts on a Monday so they can finish by the Tuesday? It is because the Wednesday is Ash Wednesday when Lent begins. So what we understand then is that people who organize the festivals and the carnivals and the work, they had in mind that we have to get as much of this entertainment and bacchanal and all this thing in time before we start the period of repentance and so on. So they go right up until Tuesday with their celebration and their road march and their carnival, you understand? And then now, Wednesday, they are as penitent as every day. But that is because, whether they know it or not, they are being influenced by the Christian worship calendar. The point I want to get across as I begin this mission, and that's the kind of background, is that it is almost natural for Lent to follow Epiphany. Because when you see God or see Christ as God, and you come to know God a little bit better, you have that revelation, it is hard for you not to think, boy, I really need to change if I'm going to go in God's presence. So the purpose of the thinking behind the transition from Epiphany into the season of Lent was that people who have just come to an understanding or a greater understanding or a better realization of who Jesus Christ is and why he deserves to be worshipped. They will now humble themselves a little more and so they go into this period of repentance where they give up something and so on. Today, we talk about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, which is one of the greatest revelations of Jesus Christ. It's when Jesus Christ revealed to his disciples in a way they had not done so before that he was the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, God in the flesh, Emmanuel. Right? And so he was using that as we'll probably see in a little bit, to encourage them. So let's we'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. And if you don't have a Bible, I know some of you may have it on your phone, you can bring your phone and just tap it and scroll down. If you don't have it, you have got one of these announcements bulletin. It's on the center spread of your announcement bulletin. Because we figure that some people are here who might not have their Bibles. So if you don't have a Bible handy, you can just look on the center spread. We'll, take, we'll put a text here for you. I want to read it. And you can read along while you can just listen. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36, so a keynote passage for today. It said, Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, the two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened, verse 33, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing, Luke has uh, what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Peter, Jesus, sorry, was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days 
of the things uh, they had seen. Very interesting verse. Very interesting. And there are so many things that we could uh, highlight, so many things that we could look at. But in the interest of time, I want to summarize what I want to say to you today. The message for you to take away is that an, an alternative title for the sermon was uh, The Transfiguration, Its Indication and Its Implication. Transformation, Transfiguration, Its Indication and Its Implication. I didn't write it down, so I'm trying to go from memory. But let's just look at what I'm talking about here. And, and to help us understand, uh, we need to understand uh, that this is just one account of the event that Luke is talking about today. This event called the Transfiguration. Matthew gives an account in his gospel message, and Mark gives an account as well. But as you read through this, a number of things, uh, and I want you to just think about the original audience. Back in 33, 34, 40, 50, 55 AD, who were reading this for the first time in their culture, knowing that even though Luke was writing to Gentiles, he was writing to Gentiles who were acquainted with the Jewish way of life and with the Jewish scriptures. And so a number of things would have jumped out at them. Right? If you look at it, I've highlighted this one word. It says, Now it came to pass about eight days after these things that he took Peter, John, and James. Now what's interesting about that is that we're talking about Jesus Christ going up on a mountain, as it says right here, up on the mountain, right? He went up on the mountain. We see later on, it says, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was, was, was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, the two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah. One of the scores right there. Because, if you are a, a Jew, if you are a proselyte, a convert to Judaism, if you are acquainted in any way with the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, you will know that Moses was the one that God gave the commandments to. You will also know that he went up on a mountain to receive those commandment, commandments. You will also know that he was accompanied by three men, right? His brother Aaron and Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. So just a little Christ is going on this mountain. We're not all 12 disciples, just three of the disciples is reminiscent for some of them of, Christ, of Moses going up Mount Sinai with three persons accompanying. And you can read it in Exodus 19, Exodus 24, and so on. You will see here also that after this whole experience, the face of Jesus Christ changed. His face, his appearance was altered. Right? You will notice that. Now, why? I can remember, I'm going to skip something. Why? Why is Jesus Christ doing this? If you Go back to Matthew, and I, I guess it's not, I didn't put it in the notes, but in the bulletin. But I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 17, right? This is Matthew's account of the same event. And to read it, it's a bit longer, but there are some very interesting things that he includes uh, that Luke didn't include, right? It says, after six days, uh, Jesus took with him. Peter, James, and John. So the same three persons is accounted for here in Matthew. But notice Matthew says six days, not eight days. And uh, we don't usually allow to speak for that. It is, it, that, that's just the way the Jews count it. Apparently, um, eight is eight inclusive. Right? It can, it, can, it can include six entire days and two parts of two days. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. Apparently, they're writing for different reasons to make different points. And one of the points that Luke wants to make in his gospel is that what Jesus Christ was doing was issuing in or ushering in a new era 
a new age. You are transition from the age of law to the age of grace. So to the, in many ways, a kind of a new beginning that the kingdom of God was bringing in. But I mention that because that's in, in Matthew chapter 17, right? Where it says, verse 2, There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his, his clothes became as white as the light. You may remember if you read Exodus 34 in another account that after Moses received the tablets from God and was coming down the hill, he did not realize how bright his face was, his countenance had changed, and his face was shining. And he had to wear a veil so the people could look at him and so on. But when again people see what has happened to Christ and about it, that would come back to their minds as well. And we'll see why in a little bit. But I want to get before this. And if you go to not Matthew 17, verse 2, but transfiguration, Matthew 16. Note what we read in Matthew 16. It says in verse 13, we have Peter's confession of Christ starting. And then we get to Verse 21. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And it gets worse. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, Luke mentions that in his gospel account, but what Matthew says after this, Luke doesn't say, and what does Matthew say? It says this, Peter, after Christ said, I must die, I'm going to be killed, right, in a few days from now. What has happened? Peter says in verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Just turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to, to me. You do not have in mind things of God, but the things of me. So what you see here is that this is perhaps the first time Jesus Christ is letting them know that even though you're seeing your miracles, even though you're seeing your walk on water, even though you're you know, raising dead, even though all of these things, I am going to die. And they couldn't deal with that. That their boss, their leader, right, their role model was going to die. Because they, some of them, thought that he had come to restore Israel to his former glory. That he had come to defeat the Romans. That he was going to be the king, the anointed one, the king, the Messiah. And you know, telling them that he's going to die. So their faith is shaken. Now, some people don't make a link. But if you skip down a bit, you see that after the transfiguration, I'm going to just verbalize it. He comes down the mountain and he is encountered by a man whose son is possessed by a demon that cast him down and called before the mountain, etc., etc. Et so he takes his son to the disciples and asks the disciples to cast out a demon. And the disciples, Bible tells us, could not. Could not. Right? No. The chances are, and possibly the things that they did in the past. But apparently, it has something to do with the fact that Jesus told them, according to one commentator, that he was going to die. That your faith was shaken to the point where the ones who used to heal could no longer heal. Because their, their faith was shaken. Right? And so Christ now had to come and heal the man on their behalf. So what is happening on the Mount of Transfiguration is that it is after this and Christ understands many people believe their, their concern that he takes them up into the mountain and transfigures himself. So the Transfiguration is in one sense for their benefit to do what? To encourage them, to let them know that even though I am going to die, I shall live again. Right? I am God. And so when you hear the voice from him saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I will please. That's a confirmation from God that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was indeed God. 
And so they could continue life as well. They didn't have to worry. They didn't have to concern. So when they were encouraged and they came down the hill, it is, it's not them, they were not the ones that were healing the child to heal the one's son. It's the others that left behind. So they would not have to come and encourage them, but they had all lost courage. So the point I'm making is this. We talk about the transfiguration. And the first we're looking at is one indication of the transfiguration. What is that? The indication of the transfiguration is glorification. The glorification of Jesus Christ. It showed the people that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed God. And that's the first part. When Christ says, uh, not Christ, the voice says uh, about what's happening there. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Some of the translations say, listen to him. That second part I submit is for us. Well, not just for us, for them, but also for us. Because that second part speaks to what? The implication of the transfiguration. So still me. We talk about the transfiguration, which means uh, a radical change in form and appearance. And in some cases, nature. And I'm saying that one first indication, and probably the main indication of that, is to show glorification of Christ as proof of Christ's divinity, even though he was 1% human and 1% divine, for the benefit of the disciples who may have had their faith shaken. But the other one is the implication, and this is what I want us to, to, to think about. Because when Christ says, uh, hear him, you know, if you go back to it, you know, it says this. Verse 30, let me read verse 30, back to Luke chapter 6. I think it's probably in your, in your, in your, in your, in your, Luke 6 verse 30. It says, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about the departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his custom, companions were very sleepy. You know, this reminds me of what happened to get some crazy brother sleep. I don't know, it was a bleach all night and was, you know, when he, when he asked to pray with him the night and get some before he died, they fell asleep. And he said, well, could you not watch me? But they were asleep or whatever. He said, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And the two men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. And he goes out. Um, I don't think I need to read much more than that, but the point I want to make is this. We talk about now the implication of what is happening here for the, those disciples, but also for us. Who was Moses? Who was Elijah? Moses is perhaps until Christ, the greatest prophet, the greatest, when the lawgiver. And Elijah was perhaps the greatest of the prophets. Right? So what we're seeing here then is, uh, if I could just, all right, I'm, I'm in Luke. I'm going to just say a few things before I get to that. We, we started our discourse, the, the reading, the King of Passion in verse 28, it says, uh, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James. The verse preceding that, verse 27 says this, I tell you the truth, Christ speaking, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And if you're a related version, that's related, that's Christ speaking. What did he say? He said, some of these very people who are here with me will not taste death, will not die, in other words, until they have seen the kingdom of God. Now, some people understand this thing that Christ was saying uh, that the kingdom of God would return uh, before they die. But many believe, and I believe with them, that he was actually talking about the transfiguration, which suggests now that the transfiguration was uh, a foretaste or a foreshadowing of the kingdom of God. Let us know that Moses would be in the kingdom of God and Elijah would be in the kingdom of God. But not only that, 
Moses is the great lawgiver. He's the one who served God He's the one who got the commandments from God. Right? Elijah is the great prophet. When you read to, in the last in the last chapter in Luke, Luke 24, you will see Jesus is on the road to Emmaus. And he encounters two disciples and they didn't recognize him. Right? And he's speaking with them. But then he said, they get to a certain point as they have a meal, that he opened their minds so that they could understand what? The law and the prophets. It's in your in your book here, you can look at it in your in your center spread. Look at Luke 24, verses 44 to 45. I put it in your to read it. Because when you could see this in your own eyes. Right? Luke 24, 44 to 45 says this. He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. This is Jesus Christ talking to his two disciples. Do you recognize me? He says that all things must be fulfilled which were written, listen to this, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And you open their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. The law, the prophets, and the writings. The Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. The law, the prophets, and the writings. The Jews have a Bible called the Tanakh. T-N-K, where they put in the air for Tanakh, right? With those three letters, symbolizing those three books. Why is it? it because it, it reminds us that everything in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ. In the, in the song with the celebration of Imnal, I'm just going to read a few verses here. In one of the worship sequences, it says this. In Genesis, Jesus is the ram at Abraham's altar. In Exodus, he is a Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is a high priest. In Numbers, he is a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is a city of our refuge. In Joshua, he is a scarlet thread in Rahab's window. In Judges, he's our judge. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. And it goes on and on and on. Every single book in the Bible points to Jesus Christ. So what we're seeing here now is when he appears on the mountain, flanked on one side by Moses and on the other side by Elijah, he's flanked by the people who represent the law and the prophets. And what does God say? God says in that setting, hear him. Now if you go and read further, it says, after they came fully away, the two men had disappeared and Jesus was left standing alone. What's the point? The point is that no, we don't have to listen to the law or the prophets. We listen to Jesus Christ. He is our lawgiver. He has replaced for us, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. And that's why he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. No, his commandments are not at odds with those commandments. But they add not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. I want to look at Matthew chapter 5. Again, on the same, same the spirit that you have there for your benefit. If you can just read Matthew chapter 5. From verse 27, it says this. You have heard that was said to those of old. Matthew 5, verses 27 to 28. You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What we're seeing Christ doing here is making the law more even more binding. Because what he's saying is that we as Christians need not only observe the letter of the law, we must also try to observe the spirit of the law. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Because what he's saying here you now, and what we should know, is that no sin happens without first becoming a thought. Before somebody sins, they think about what they're going to do. And that's what we read in James chapter 1. 
In James chapter 1, in your sentence prayer again, what does that James say? James says, let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. What we're seeing here, brethren, sisters and friends, is what we call the progression of sin. A lot of people think it is, it is a sin to be tempted. No, that's not a temptation. That's not a sin. The sin is not in the temptation. The sin lies in yielding to the temptation. And that's why Christ, he says, could be tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, because there's a delay between the temptation and the sin. What Christ is doing, right, by giving us the Beatitudes, by making the law more binding, by saying it is not just a sin to commit a physical act with someone else to commit adultery, but just to think lustful thoughts to that area, you're just as guilty. Why? Because Christ knows that the lustful thoughts can become lustful actions. And what we know to know, what we need to understand as Christian Virgin, is this transition period, this period between this temptation and the sin. And nip it in the body. And that's why God wants us to bring every thought part of us into subjection. So that they don't cause us to sin. Right? More, David, I think the psalmist said, I have hidden your law in my heart that I would not sin against you. Right? That's what he means. So, so when Christ says, do not, you've heard it said. What did he say? You've heard it said by who? By the law and the prophet, by Moses and Elijah and the other prophet. But I, because I have chosen, I say unto you, do not even get angry. Because he knows that anger can lead to murder. So if you want to avoid a murder, don't just wait until this is the morning, go down the cutlass or the knife. Deal with every young thought that, boy, we can't bother the mother, we can't this, right? That's that. When you start off the wrong thoughts, that's what he needs to do. When it's still a thought, when it, before it becomes a desire. And so what we're seeing here then is that. The transfiguration as an indication, which is glorification, for the sake of the disciples to encourage them. But it also has an implication for them that they must listen to him working because he is the one, but also for us 2,000 years later because he is our Lord, he is our Savior, he is the one we are becoming like. And what's the implication? That implication is a transformation. Transformation. I'm not telling against us, we have other things to do, we have the lessons to come. But that was, as it turned, it's not in the notes, but don't be your Bible, can turn to Romans chapter 12. We're going to read two verses. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I want you to read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 to say. Romans 12, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. <laughs> All right, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, and this is Romans chapter 12, right? After Romans chapter 1 to 11, where Paul is telling his audience, the Christians in Rome, about all the wonderful things that God has done for them, right? Oh, yes, saying Jesus Christ as the second Adam, right? We're all of sin and fortune with what God has sent Christ to pay the penalty that we are reconciled by his death. Paul tells us that we shall be saved by his life. After recounting some of the wonderful things that God has done for us, he says this in verse 12. Therefore, in light of everything I've said before, if everything I've written, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. No need for you to kill a calf 
or a bull or a goat or a lamb or a turtle dog. No, you offer yourself by doing what? By obeying Christ even when it's not convenient. That's what the living sacrifice is. When you do things that you don't want to do because that's what pleases God. And you deny what that's why that's what that's what Lent is about, you know. When people give up pork or shrimp or party or is that thing like gallism? <laughs> For the gallus. <laughs> if you decide to give up all of those things, you're you're saying, Father, I am ready to deny myself for these four days, right? Because Lent is what? Lent is all about Easter for us, Easter preparation. We're looking forward now to the time of Christ's death and time of Christ's To the time of pen, not, not penance, repentance and penitence. So what does he say? He says this. Therefore, in light of all that God has done for us, right? In view of God and God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And then he says in verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. Do not do things just because you see other people doing them. You know, sometimes you go to a church, I'm not sure the word right now, see, but I've done it. And they get up and they start to clap and they do things. And you don't feel like clapping. But they start to clap to God. That's what everybody says. They feel out of pain. So you eat. What you're doing there, you're actually conforming. You're doing the thing, not from your heart, but from your head. Christ says, Paul says, right? After he's by bread, that we as Christians need to start living our lives from our hearts. And he wants our heart in a right relationship with God. So what he said, he said, do not be conformed to the world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want to focus on the word transformed. You know, the word transformed, Is similar to the word transfigure. It means a change in appearance. It usually means a change in form. But some dictionaries add the word in a change in character. And why is that? Because a transfiguration, for the most part, what Christ went through, is a physical. What they saw was a change in his physical appearance. What I'm saying to you today is that the implication for us is that God wants a change in our spiritual performance. That's what he wants. He wants a change, not in our appearance, not in our form, but in our character. Right? He wants us to do what? Render our hearts and not our garments. We say render, it's really render, right? Don't tear up your clothes and something but you know, ashes and sackcloth and really, really, no. God wants a broken and contrite spirit to this man like look. That's what he wants. He wants us to do that. So he wants us to transformation, the change in character. What did he say here? How is a person transformed the way Paul wants us to transform? He says this, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Transformation begins by the way we think about Christ, the way we see him, the way we see how he relates to us and how we should relate to him. It all begins in the mind. And it all begins uh, with the recognition that Jesus of Nazareth was more than just a man. That he was fully man, yes, but he was also fully God. And worthy of our praise and all honor and all glory and worship because he was 100% God. When he said in Philippians that he emptied himself, he didn't empty himself as a divinity, he emptied himself as a privilege, and he still had the right. He still had the power to do all kinds of things, read people's minds, walk on water, turn water to wine. He could do all those things because he was still God. But he reserved, the, the, restrained himself not to do them, except he was meant to bring glory to God, 
are the absolutely necessary. So to conclude, what can we say? Today is Transfiguration Sunday. Just like when you have Easter Sunday and Christmas Day and so it's a specific day. It's the eighth Sunday after the Epiphany. It's a time when we reflect on the work of Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ has revealed to us by his action, by his word, that he was and is the Messiah. And that's the indication. The indication is that he wants us to be transformed. Yes, come as you are. Yes, he'll accept you as you are. But he doesn't want you to stay as you are. He wants you to become less as you are now and become more like him. And it all begins in the mind. With the mind. That's what repentance is about. Repentance is about a change in mind that will result in a change in behavior. And so we begin by remembering that just Christ was transfigured, that he is God. And we accept him as our God, as our Lord and Savior. And we try to start to live now to please him as much as we can. Only then will we see the transformation which God wants taking place in our life. So let us see not to conform, but to be transformed and become more like Christ by receiving him as he is, understanding who he is, what he has done for us, and loving him more and more. Let us pray. Father, for my God, we bow your presence one more time. We thank you to God for the time we have spent together. We pray to God that we have heard from you. We pray to God that we not only hear us of your word, but we seek to do us as well. That we try to reflect on what we have heard, meditate on what we have heard, but more important, to try and act on what we have heard. just send your word, Father. If not, they hear us of the word, but they do us as we justify. So we seek each other that to be among those that you regard as doers of your word. Thank you again for this time. We just pray now to God that you come in to provide for us, give us even better and greater understanding. But the understanding we do have, help us to act on it and just allow each other that you must live your life in us and through us so that you can become lights for other people, showing them how to be done, that we need this is to them as well. So thank you again. We just ask you to come to the blessing and do so with confidence for we have to Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.